It is uh, now time for a very prestigious award, and that is, of course, the Australian Songwriters Hall of Fame. And I'm happy to say that I'll be handing over to someone else to make the uh, Hall of Fame presentation tonight. And he's a man who needs no introduction. And how often have you heard compares say that and then take three minutes to get him up on stage? I promise I won't do that because you know him anyway. The rock brain of the universe, Mr. Glenn A. Baker. Thank you, Mike. Now, Angry had given a bit of advice to Joe, saying what he needed was a good shirt. I immediately ran to my car and became thus resplendent. Angry, I paid attention. It falls to me again to be here and to perform this very important task. Before I begin, may I say one thing. I know it's been a long night and I know you're probably rather tired, but given the acoustics of this room and given that a few minutes is required for me to be able to detail what I need to, I would ask you, if you could, to refrain from conversing amongst yourselves because what tends to happen is a bit of wall of industrial white noise comes back. So if you could pay attention, I would like to say, without, with undue modesty, that it was, is worth it. Now... Here I am. Now, before we'd ever heard of Bruce Springsteen... ...was the boss. He still is. For almost 40 years, his deftly constructed songs have entertained and enlivened and have been integral to what is referred to as the soundtrack of our lives to our rite of passage here in the lower continent. Ross Wilson's start in rock and roll was the classic schoolboy dream. As a 14 and a half year old rabid blues fanatic fronting Melbourne garage band The Pink Finks, he managed to crash into his hometown top 20 in 1965 with a snarling, grisly version of Louie Louie which still sounds as if it was sung by an aged black man. When required to appear on afternoon TV's commotion, Ross would turn up on the set after school, stash his uniform in his satchel and be picked up afterwards by his parents. Bandmate guitarist Ross Hannaford was in much the same position, he being six months younger than Wilson. At the end of 1966, the two formed the party machine with Kiwi refugee Mike Rudd. This strange ensemble found more notoriety than success, particularly when the Victorian Vice Squad deemed Wilson's lyrics to be either obscene or seditious and seized all copies of a printed songbook after a complaint from the outraged parents of a schoolgirl into whose hands it had fallen. A career turning point of sorts came in 1969 when Ross was summoned to England to help revive a claimed but commercially hopeless Australian progressive rock band Procession. Although he didn't record with them, he worked at many major venues during the dying days of swinging London. I did lots of interesting things, I met lots of interesting people and I discovered some music I hadn't heard before, primarily certain types of rhythm and blues and doo-wop rock and roll, he once detailed. But more importantly, he came to a startling realisation. I thought, yeah, there's a future in this. As I grow up, I'm still going to like this music. That's when I decided to get real serious about it and dig in. Now, Ross hitchhiked home from London and initially he went down the ultra-progressive road with the terribly artsy and zappa-ish Sons of the Vegetal Mother. But at the same time, he put together a side band with his good mate Hannaford and two, Melbourne, two members of veteran Melbourne band the Rondells, resplendent in Mickey Mouse ears, helicopter caps and raccoon tail, the rollicking good time band debuted at the Cosmic TF Much Ballroom in November 1970 and found instant acceptance and popularity. It is one of Oz Rock's truly intriguing ironies 
that Ross Wilson, one of our most persistent and talented musical innovators, should have found what was his most enduring success with abandoned concept initiated as a humorous diversion from the serious business of advancing the horizons of rock music. But that is essentially how the great Daddy Cool came about. As a joke, as a bit of a hoot. Mixing covers of obscure but magnificent vintage and mostly black rock and roll and rhythm and blues songs with clever, appealing originals, Daddy Cool cut a swathe through the sea of bands gazing at their sandal feet. Bring meandering and sometimes moronic 20-minute guitar and drum solos. Here, finally, was some energy on stage, a vibrant and joyous celebration of rock and roll to warm the heart and touch the soul. The response surprised the hell out of me because it wasn't planned, he once recalled. It just took off from gig one. I think at the time, Australians were just pissed off sitting on the floor listening to long blues blows. They didn't know they wanted to dance, but we did, and they soon caught on. And indeed they did. They heard and instantly adored the sense of integrity and passion with which the exercise was accomplished. Now in London, Ross had seen a photograph in a Sunday newspaper colour supplement of some American Southern blacks in the 1930s dancing around a dirt shack. Beneath it was the caption, Some Negroes do the eagle rock and cut the pigeon wing. I thought it was such a great photo and a great name for a dance, he, he has explained. I was teaching myself to play guitar around the same time, trying to get some finger-picking happening, and I came up with the Eagle Rock riff. I went around asking anyone if they'd heard it before because it was real good, and I thought I might have pinched it from someone. <laughs> now, Ross initially tried to palm the song off on Ross Hannaford's band Quinn, but it met disinterest, so it sat around until Daddy Cool came into being. When finally released, it spent eight weeks at number one, was named Single of the Year, and enabled Daddy Cool to storm past the Master's Apprentices, the Zoot and Shane, on the all-important 1971 Go Set Pop Pole. On the flip was another nifty original, Bomb Bomb, a fine tribute to doo-wop. A debut album, Daddy Who, Daddy Cool, also went to number one, while a second single, Come Back Again, made it to number two. The album sold 60,000 copies, the largest sales ever for a local album. Now, there was a second Daddy Cool album, provocatively titled, For The Day, Sex, Dope, Rock and Roll, Teenage Heaven. The hits rolled fast and furious, with the first two followed by Hi Honey Ho and I'll Never Smile Again, each a piece of snappy, hummable pop. There was a Melbourne New Daily newspaper campaign to ban the album and its supposedly smutty songs, a development that certainly didn't displease the coolest daddy of all, who'd been down that road before and held to a belief that a performing artist's most, worth, most worthwhile creativity springs from the dark side of the personality, or as he puts it, the secret life that everybody likes to have. By the end of 1972, frustrated by their failure to make a significant impact in America after three visits, Daddy Cool, not much more than two years after their explosive debut, called it quits, and by 1973, both the Rosses could be found in Mighty Kong, who had a moderate hit with All I Want to Do Is Rock in early 74, the year that Daddy Cool reunited for the Sunbury Festival and Wilson produced what was then the biggest-selling Australian album of all time, Living in the 70s by Skyhawks, followed by the second biggest-selling, Ego is Not a Dirty Word, by The Hooks. Kept from the record.